The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Prep for All Ages, a comprehensive look at employing HIV prevention strategies across all age groups. Featuring Dr. Richard Elian from George Washington University School of Medicine and Washington Health Institute in Washington, D.C., and Dr. Rupa R. Patel from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash HNA860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello. This is Dr. Rick Elliott from the George Washington University School of Medicine and Washington Health Institute in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the educational activity on pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP for HIV prevention. Joining me in this discussion today is a uh, dear friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Rupa Patel from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome, Rupa. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me. Ha happy to have you. We're going to talk a little bit about PrEP today, and I, I guess the first thing is you know, in the midst of COVID, we've got uh, a lot of viral infections. And I guess the question becomes, why so much attention on HIV? Why, why is it so important, Rupa, that we prevent HIV? Why, why has it not gone away? Well, Rick, we've got the um, antiretrovirals now. It's, a, it's a really about, you know, with, with prevention and treatment as prevention, um, it's a really about reaching the population. And um, we know that we have the tools to actually end the epidemic and us as a community as providers and community-based organizations and um, community members, we just need to come together and, and actually use the tools that we have. And I, I think to, to support that, I mean, it's still, in 2020, we had 1.5 million new people infected with HIV. And as you said, Rupa, we have the tools between treatment as prevention and PrEP to make that number zero. And yet we still have 1.5 million people. What, what, what's keeping us from making the progress? What, what, what's, the, what's the roadblock? Well, I think there are um, enough barriers around regarding access to healthcare, um, knowledge about you know, HIV and getting testing. There's stigma. Um, those are some of the barriers, Rick. So I think you said stigma. I think part of it, to, to amplify the stigma question a little bit, is that we're talking about a disease that's passed through sex. And doctors, patients are uncomfortable about having frank conversations about sex. I don't think that the, we, we've come to a new age of, of you know, equality between genders. I don't know if we can say equality, but we're seeking to get equality and understanding between uh, LGBTQ populations. But I think this stigma has still remained. It brings us to the point about prophylaxis, though, in that we have different kinds of prophylaxis. Can you talk about the difference between the pre, post, and treatment as prevention as different tools to lower HIV incidence? Yeah. And so, um, in general, we've got three big categories for biomedical interventions to prevent HIV. The first one is PrEP. This is um, pre-exposure. So, the pre exposure is really important versus the post-exposure. So it means that before you come into contact with HIV, are you taking this medication to prevent you from having um, HIV? And it's a daily medication. It's a combination of two medications and one pill. And then that brings me to the second category of kind of biomedical uh, HIV prevention, and that would be post-exposure prophylaxis. And it's using essentially medications, three medications um, to be exact, after somebody has had exposure. And usually you wanna take those medications within 72 hours of being exposed and you take it for a total of 28 days. And the third big bucket is, is what we call treatment as prevention or TASP. And it's really using antiretrovirals or medications um, in persons who are HIV positive to bring down the viral load to what we call undetectable or suppressed viral load. And so then when someone has an undetectable viral load, it's harder for that HIV positive person to actually pass on that virus to an HIV negative person. And, and this, this improvement of undetectable, meaning untransmittable, has been a huge thing for the HIV community because it means that people who are taking their medicine successfully really are not at risk for infecting others. However, we still have only about 60% or less nationally across the country who are virologically suppressed. And so I think that raises the issue that 
like close close to 60 percent of new infections are caused by people who know they're HIV positive but might not be on proper medication. So I think that's really why the prevention, if treatment as prevention would really be widespread, there would be no need for that. Kind of the way we think about vaccination with COVID, if people did that widespread, but they don't. And so because of that, this means treatment is uh, prep pre-exposure prophylaxis becomes important for those people who are with those people who are positive, but not taking their medication. So Rupert, there's, you, you talked about two different medications that are used for prevention. Can you describe what they are and the differences between the two? Yeah, uh, thanks Rick. Yeah, there's two main medications. One is called m and tenofovir disoproxyl um, or FTC and TDF. Um, and the second medication is um, m and tenofovir alafinamide. FTC and TAF. And so the, the TDF and the TAF act differently in the body. One circulates around in the body, the TDF. The other one stays more concentrated in the cells. That also um, gives them a slightly different um, profile on the effects of the body. Both um, generally are cleared by the kidney and can cause some um, uh, changes in the kidney function or the creatinine clearance. Um, they also can change... Um, uh, very insignificantly, the um, bone mineral uh, changes in the body. And um, in, in general, they're, they're prescribed every day. Um, the medication with uh, tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate has also been um, looked at to um, have PrEP as, an, as on demand. So one of the things I've, I've, I've noticed about these, these approaches is that, first of all, the efficacy for the TDF, compound and both for and TAF, TAF compound, are very similar. And the, the effectiveness when people take the medications are very effective. The real question is what happens in, when people are not taking these medicines effectively? And there's been some studies to suggest that once you get to steady state, meaning you've been on them for a week, you've got to take at least four to five days every week, and you can't miss that. And, 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 and so I guess a question I would have for you is, um, A, do you think on a population level, we know that these approaches have been successful and how has people's different adherences affected that, that uh, overall prevention, preventive effectiveness, so to speak? Great question, Rick. I think in general, going from your randomized control trials to your demonstration projects and open label to really looking at what's happening in cities, um, we're seeing a reduction of HIV incidents when you're scaling up treatment as prevention, but also in the context of um, PrEP, scale up of PrEP, citywide, free in clinics. Um, so it is effective. And I think one also important distinction by the two meds we didn't talk about, Rick, is the tenofovir alafinamide is generally um, not used in women uh, just because it hasn't been studied. So that's an important difference for our audience for prescribing for cisgender women. Right. And I just to add to that, Rupa, that's very important because the TAF compound isn't approved for, for women yet. So it's really just for men as those tests go forward. But, and I think other data which looked at when treatment as, a, as prevention was used in different states, in states that had higher rates of PrEP, their incidence went down. And so I think we've got real real world evidence that PrEP is uh, very effective when people take it regularly. The question is, I guess, you know, wh what do you think keeps people from taking the pills every day? Why, 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 is, why do your patients, are, why are some patients unable to sustain that? Yeah, Rick, that, that's a really important discussion point about um, how do young adults or, um, you know, uh, even older adults try to keep consistently taking a daily oral pill engaging with a provider, prep is some work. They have to, you know, people have to attend a clinic um, and kind of retain in care. They also have to remember to take these medications. And so a lot of the barriers go back to the lessons learned with HIV, um, you know, uh, transportation issues, changes in employment, mobility, homelessness, um, you know, uh, you know, the stigma affecting this consistently of being able to keep the pills in the house, take them and go to the clinic effortlessly. Um, and, and in some cases, people don't have support to even talk about their care with their family or their siblings or their relatives, their friends. Um, and so I think it's the entire ecosystem that you need to really be 
um, consistently taking a daily pill and having access to it, um, and then going to the doctor to maintain getting the laboratories and the conversations related to taking the pill. We'll, we'll get to the use of injections for that in a second, but I, I think it's been interesting. We, you and I had worked together on some projects looking at the uses of virtual visits for PrEP and where people are doing telemedicine for PrEP. And, and our experience has been that when people connect, it works, but we haven't seen the ability for people to not come into the office and do this virtually really increase the rates of PrEP uptake. I'd say it's been kind of consistent and steady, but not, a, not an increase as we hoped we'd see when we decrease the barriers for entry. But, but it raises the question about there are at least you know, over 1.2 million people who are thought to be eligible for PrEP, but they're not engaging in it. And we see geographical differences in that. What, what are some, what, what do you think are some of the, you, you talked about some of the obstacles, but what can be done to help lower that number of people? Rick, you decide, described who is eligible, and, and we do have 1.2 million. Um, we only have roughly, you know, 250,000 people um, prepped today of that 1.2 million. Um, unfortunately, we've definitely seen the situation where of the people on prep right now, a very small fraction are um, Black, African-American men and women, and then a, a small fraction of that is Hispanic and Latino in the context that um, HIV incidence is highest in those race and ethnicities. Um, and it goes back to also geography. We know the South um, has um, the bulk of the new HIV infections in the United States. And, and I think barriers to all of that goes back down to the heart of um, access to healthcare, um, you know, deserts in terms of clinics and community-based organizations that actually have prep prescribing and providers that are able to take a sexual history and, and offer prep. Um, so, and, and then the cost itself of going to the clinic and the transportation, et cetera. So I think um, you've described really nicely who's eligible, where the gaps are, and why are some of the gaps um, existing? I think it's useful the way you divided that, Rupa, to look at it from a patient point of view and a provider point of view. From the patient's point of view, I want to add that I think there's an underestimation of risk sometimes, that patients don't perceive themselves to be at risk. Some of my female patients who maybe have one partner, when you ask them, do you think your partner is monogamous, they say, oh, no. But they think of themselves as only having one partner, even though their partner may be with five or ten people. And so that's one issue around perception of risk. And the second, I think, is for providers to do that. Let's talk about how providers look at risk. Can you talk about the CDC recommendations for people to listen to see who are the appropriate candidates? What would be the relevant questions you would ask to ascertain who's at risk and who needs PrEP? Yes, that's um, a really good point, Rick. And I think it's really important to also highlight when we, when we discuss screening and eligibility, the first biggest thing we need to do, Rick, is we need to promote all providers and medical directors, clinic managers, organizations. They need to create safe space, safe spaces. Um, and that's really important for clients to be able to come in and set the stage between the provider and the client to have some trust, know there's some confidentiality, um, and have some comfortability and even some cultural competency, even with, you know, in the in the clinic or in the um you know, the waiting room to have posters engaging um, with appropriate pictures and messages regarding to prep. So before we go into the actual nitty gritty of eligibility and who, how we should decide or, or kind of think about who's eligible, I think it's really important to take a step back and say, you know, in the U.S., we really have to develop more safe spaces and foster sexual history taking and create that trust. And um, usually what's really important about discussing PrEP is um, in a very non-judgmental way, setting the stage and saying, we go ahead and we ask everybody this um, at any point of their life, how many, um, you know, how many partners have you had in the last three to six months? Tell me about your partners. Um, is anyone HIV positive? Um, you know, is anyone male or female? Um, have you had any recent STIs? Do your partners have any recent STIs? Um, have you been able to use a condom? What are those barriers if you, if you haven't? Um, and I think one, one way to look at um, eligibility is, is there's three core 
groups of people in the United States, just that was, as we talked about in terms of the 1.1 million, is um, gay and bisexual men have known higher prevalences and incidents of HIV, and we should be asking about um, sexual practices in the context of what I've just described, partners, condoms. And also very important, we should be asking about um, you know, have you exchanged yourself for food, housing, drugs, um, not, not just money? Um, and then I think we need to ask some of the same questions with cisgender men and women. Um, and then also, um, we don't ask this enough, but we need to ask about substance use and drug use, um, chem sex, and in, you know, injection drug use, sharing of needles. And that kind of breaks down CDC guidance on um, how to have that conversation and among whom would PrEP be, um, you know, ideal for where the individual may be benefited, where they're not, um, where, where they're preventing their risk of getting HIV. Well, I, I, I think you invoked an incredibly important and challenging concept, which is a safe, non-judgmental space. And, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. It has to start with the outreach materials. It has to start with the, with the first people who sit where the patient comes into the building and how they, they greet them and, and every step of the way, because I think there's so much both prejudice about sexual health and homophobia and uh, biases against uh, substance users, that to be able to brave that and come into a clinic for help is hard for a patient. And we as healthcare providers have to work really hard. I think the CDC guidance talks about, um, and, and you know, have you had a, a, a sexual partner in the last six months that you, uh, I, I like to think of, hey, you had three different partners perhaps. Has there been, are you in a monogamous relationship or are you with multiple people? Have you had an STI, any STI, because that would be an indication of, of risk. And um, I think any of those, uh, if you're not using condoms on a regular basis, and I don't even hardly ask that anymore because I don't trust what people tell me about using condoms. So it's more just the number of partners I, I use. And I, I think that it raises the other question about the difference between TDF, TAF, which we made a distinction about for, uh, for, for cis women, but what about on-demand PrEP? Um, can you talk about that? Because some patients are saying, might say they're only having sex twice a month, three times a month, they don't want to be on a pill every day. What, what's, the, what, what's, the, what's, what's your sense about PrEP on-demand and how much do you recommend that? Yeah, that's a good question, Rick. Um, and this goes back to the sexual history. And Rick, I want to make another point about the sexual history. You know, the CDC has endorsed something called the five P's, partners, practices, past history of STIs, protection from STDs, and pregnancy plans. And, you know, the, the way to segue into 211 is tell me about your sex life. You know, this is how we can ask about partners and practices. Um, and how, how often do you have sex? Um, is, is it planned um, or is it, you know, more spontaneous? And so when we, that leads us into the discussion of daily versus event-driven or on-demand or what we call 211. And I just want to clarify the audience, two big things. Daily oral prep with FTC and TDF or TDF-based prep is FDA-approved and guideline recommended. Daily oral prep with FTC and TAF or TAF or what we call TAF-based prep, that's also approved. Um, by the FDA and guideline, um, CDC guideline um, uh, pending with the 2021 draft guidelines. And when we shift the conversation to on-demand, we have to realize that on-demand is only with FTC and TDF. It is off-label, so it's not FDA approved yet. And it is guideline recommended um, by the WHO, but also the CDC will be incorporating T um, 211 in their guidelines in 2021, but they were presented as draft. And so um, when we have a conversation about 211, we really wanna first think about who can we offer it to and who can we not. The mo first and most important thing is um, 211 means you take two pills um, roughly 24 hours or the same day uh, of having sex. So it's basically anywhere from 24 to three hours before you have sexual activity. And then you take one pill 24 hours after that sexual activity episode, and then another pill 24 hours after that, or about 48 hours 
from the time that you had sex. So you're taking four pills for every one sexual um, engagement. And 211 should not be offered to individuals that have chronic hepatitis B because tenofovir um, does treat hepatitis B and we would, want, would not want somebody who's hepatitis B positive receiving treatment on and off. Number two, we should not be offering 211 for cisgender women because it was never studied um, in a population of women. And um, number three, um, talking about on-demand, um, it requires you to really have the pills ready, take a certain regimen, take it before. So ideally, you would have some sort of predictability um, to having your sexual encounter to be able to have those two pills ready. Um, and so you would want someone that was able to predict sex, and you would also would want somebody that feels comfortable to be able to take a schedule like this, to have those pills, remember this 211 schedule, remember to take it again. And part of this is also the frequency of sex. If someone is having sex every day, um, almost 30 times per month, um, it would be better off that they're on daily oral prep. Um, so 211 um, is really made for individuals who can have infrequent um, predictive sex, predictable sex. My, my predictable sex is an interesting expression. I, I, I think that I've tried to look at this as if you're having sex twice a week, you're going to be needing to take eight pills. And if you're, doing, if you're taking eight pills for sex twice a week, you might as well be taking daily. So it's really for people who are having much more intermittent sex. And I, I want to also underline what you said about the five Ps, and you articulated them so clearly. But I think for our listeners, it's not so much that you were thinking of each of those Ps, that issue of the partners, their practices, the past history of STDs, protection from STDs, pregnancy issues. You don't, you're not thinking of it that way. Rather, you're asking an open conversation to let the patient describe what their sexual lifestyle is like, and then using their expression of that to, to really be the entry into what you're going to talk about for PrEP. I think that's a, a really great way to do it. In terms of the, um, uh, the surveillance once a person's on PrEP, I think that we know that uh, the initial visit includes both pregnancy test, st thorough STI testing, hepatitis B testing, as you talked about, because you want to know you don't want people to be intermittent with their hepatitis B treatment, and uh, TDF or TAP and FTC are treatments for Hep B. Uh, looking at renal function, um, assessing risk and making sure that they're doing that, and then some kind of ongoing counseling for adherence. How often do you think you need to see patients? I know the current CDC recommendations say every three months. Are you still doing it every three months? I know some providers have shifted to every six months. Yeah, Rick, that's a great question. I think we have to go back to, you know, making this client-centered care, client-focused care, client-tailored care. And when I see a client struggling with um, taking their pills every day, having more questions, needing more um, interaction for comfortability, I really try to see them based on their comfort. So I'll ask them, how often do you want to see me? I'd like to see you no more than every three months. But my general approach is actually to see the client, and you've mentioned surveillance and baseline. I also want to throw in we should be asking about acute symptoms of HIV. Um, and so based on that, I will go ahead and um, see them in a month. So I'll write a 30-day prescription with one month refill, and I will schedule a one-month follow-up because that's important. I want to make sure um, they didn't have any more questions. They didn't have any problems with the pharmacy or uh, the cost of the medication. I've had people actually come back a month later and say, um, I didn't have time to call you, but I, I couldn't pay for the med or I couldn't get it. And so um, if I saw them three months later, they would have essentially have not gotten that prep. I also want to check in about family life. Prep is the gateway to healthcare. So it's that second visit. I can start getting them a regular doctor, getting them vaccines. Um, getting them into mental health care or substance use, what to have more deeper conversations as we develop comfortability. Um, and I want to help with assessing that window period for HIV. So I'll go ahead and get another, another HIV test within four weeks apart, just to kind of start closing that um, the the window period for the detection of HIV. So I usually call people um, at the one month mark, and then every three months thereafter, if someone's younger need some more um, conversation, then I'll call them 
every month for the first three months. But um, what what I want to get across to everyone is in the early stages of prep, try to follow up a little more and get your client comfortable. And, and you know, it, it's like riding a bicycle to take a medicine every day. I'm really trying to help someone to get that routine um, and give them pill taking support for maximizing adherence. Rupa, I'd like to pick up on the differences between TDF and TAF base, and they have different uh, requirements. For TDF, the requirement is that creatinine clearance has to be greater than 60. But for TAF, it only has to be greater than 30 for the most part. But the issue is, is less about finding people who fall in that zone than who are the proper candidates for TDF versus TAF. What clinical distinctions do you make where you find TAF is the right, TAF based prep is the right approach versus TDF? Yeah, we touched upon that a little earlier. I think the first thing is um, cisgender women um, should not be prescribed TAF. Somebody that wants 211 or on demand should not be prescribed TAF. Um, someone that has um, a creatinine clearance that we know of um, below 60 um, should not be prescribed TDF, and maybe you'll have to prescribe TAF. Some other things around TAF that are generally not talked about enough are the weight gain that may be associated with TAF. I've definitely had people that have um, gained on the order of 10 pounds or more, and that has been a struggle, and we had to switch over to TDF. Um, also, cholesterol issues. Um, the new draft guidelines um, have really nicely laid this out for monitoring. We need to get triglycerides, uh, triglyceride um, levels, um, cholesterol levels, um, and go ahead and assess the lipid profile on monitoring. So someone that's already on a statin um, may not be ideal for TAF. Interesting. I, I, don't, I don't quite approach it exactly the same way. First of all, in terms of TDF and TAF, I think of TAF really because of the issues around bone and bone deposition as being really important for folks under 25, where bone's being deposited. So in that population, TAF is really preferential for me. Um, and again, excluding women, of course. And then um, from 25 to 50, I think it's very individual. I don't have any real caveats. And then at about age 50, 55, the issue of bone demineralization becomes relevant to me again. And then I think about the use of TAF in that population, because as you mentioned earlier, TAF is going to have less of an impact on demineralization of bone than TDF has. The second issue uh, around uh, weight gain is a, a really kind of uh, tricky issue. Because I, I think there's been literature to support exactly what you said, that there's higher weight gains with TAF. But I think there's other literature that doesn't comport with that and shows similar gains between TDF and TAF, especially in PrEP. In the Discover study, there was a little bit more of a gain, but not, not a huge uh, uh, gain. And, and there's some people I know who think that TDF can be associated with even sometimes a little bit of appetite suppression. So it's not so much that we're seeing gain, but we're just seeing more relative gain in one compared to the other. So I don't... You, I don't I'm not thinking anymore in terms of prevention about TAF in terms of that weight gain, though clearly there are outliers and that we have to think about switching in that population. Let me ask you a question about a population that's dear to my own heart, and that's older folks. Um, we know that older folks are having sex sometimes way more commonly than we think. We often talk about the needs to tailor things for adolescents, more frequent visits, the issue of bone loss, but in folks over 50, are there any approaches you found relevant for helping that population deal with their sexual risk? Um, feeling comfortable with the doctor, you know, having that holistic care. Um, we've we've really tried hard to find um, HIV prevention clinics and integrated with primary care, really geared for um, someone that can take care of diabetes and other comorbidities and um, create a safe space for having those sexual health discussions and, uh, you know, getting STI testing routinely and and not feeling any stigma by asking your provider that you want to go ahead and get all these other things too and bundle your labs together. So really trying to make kind of a, a holistic primary care approach. Uh, one of my final questions is uh, I, uh, recently data from HPTN studies looking 083 and 084, looking at the use of an injectable medication, cabotegravir, for PrEP. And the studies, unlike most HIV studies, were stopped by the DSMV boards because of the greater efficacy of the injections. Where do you see the role of in, in injections for PrEP compared to our two existing oral approaches? Yeah, that's a great optimistic note that you've brought us to, Rick. I think the audience should know that, you know, PrEP is a concept. It's the use of medications to prevent HIV before someone acquires HIV. 
And that concept embodies kind of this um, plethora of different medicines being looked at and in different formulations, injections, micro patches, um, implants. And so with that being said, we've come to this new era of where we're going to have a menu of options where you can take a pill uh, intermittently or a pill daily. And now you're going to take an injection, which is every two months. Um, it'll be ideal for some. It won't be ideal for some. But it will be our first attempt to make start making that menu of options other than the pill for people that, uh, you know, taking a pill is really hard or keeping those pills um, in their, uh, you know, house or their car or, you know, even outside of the United States, um, you know, in places where there's a crowded living. Um, so I think um, this is exciting. And um, to know that these new modalities coming out, Rick, so important, also have just as high efficacy and effectiveness as the daily oral pill. It, you know, this brings us into a new era. It's a, it'll be a game changer and, and help us uh, reduce the number of new HIV infections in the U.S. and actually worldwide. I couldn't agree more. Let me, let me close on a less optimistic note. Where do you see the biggest challenges in making PrEP? I mean, we're still talking optimistically, but there's so many people who are still not accessing PrEP. We talked about the structural changes and the societal issues in relation to healthcare, which are very hard to fix. For the providers out there, what, what's a message you want to offer to help them with the challenges they'll be facing for PrEP? Yeah, so I think for providers that haven't touched PrEP or are are still uncomfortable or, or still haven't gotten more, that, more than that one patient or client um, on PrEP. Um, PrEP is the standard of care. It's highly effective. I want to remind providers it's essentially unethical to not offer PrEP if the client in front of you is at risk and we, and we know what objective risk is, multiple STIs, someone saying that they're having condomless sex. Um, so to the providers out there, you know, we have to talk about it. We have to offer it. We have to engage in conversation. It'll be multiple conversations with your client. And um, we, it is our duty to create wraparound services in the location that we provide care. We have to have um, linkage to care uh, staff. We have to have support staff. We have to have navigators. Um, we have to, you know, start using innovation like SMS texting kind of modalities for follow-up and retention and adherence. So, um, to the providers out there, you know, it, it's you and the system, and it is our ethical duty to bring uh, this tool to its full potential by implementing it into the healthcare system fully and then getting out of our comfort zone, you know, go, going to the bathhouse and the clubs and the youth group sessions with CBOs, community-based organizations, and, and talking about it and bringing comfortability around it, debunking myths myths that it'll, you know, kill your liver or damage your kidney or um, cause kidney failure. It, it is really our job to bring it out there and increase access and, and, and help generate demand for it. I, I, I think that's incredibly important the way you phrased it as an ethical issue. I, I think when you look at the number needed to treat in order to acquire a certain outcome, that PrEP in the right population was a much lower number needed to treat or a more, a more efficacious mode of prevention than we see for a primary prevention of heart disease in which lipid-lowering therapies are used routinely. And I think it raises the, 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 the point about the ethical obligation to deal with sexual health versus the challenge of people dealing with sexual health. And I, I think that really encapsulates the, the challenge of PrEP. Rupa, this has been a very helpful conversation, but I want to give clinicians a kind of application of these principles to real life. So let me give you two, two quick patients. You get a, you get a minute each. So uh, ready? Go. Young African-American woman, 17, comes in with a prior history of two STIs, doesn't know what her partners are doing, inquires about PrEP, not sure. Take it from there. Yeah, so the first thing is, um, welcoming, welcoming her to the clinic, making her feel comfortable, telling her that I would be asking um, not only her, but all my clients that walk in the door, all these questions. There's no judgment to any of the question to her, any of her answers that um, she, she has today. And I would ask her um, in general, how many partners did you have in the last three months? Um, I'll confirm or talk to her about 
her STIs, what her feelings about those diagnoses were. Did she get treatment? And I would let her know about the fact that there's one pill once a day um, out there to prevent HIV by 99%. Um, she can take it however she wants. Um, you know, it's empowerment in general for any individual to kind of have ownership of their own HIV uh, prevention kind of outlook. And um, I would describe how she can get it, um, you know, simple prescription, go to the pharmacy, help follow up works, you know, checking in in one month and then every three months. I'll also tell her about the labs that we would get, um, the HIV, um, the uh, kidney test. Um, if she has a prior, ask her a little more about her medical history. If she's got any um, history with kidney disease or bone disease that I should know about. And um, uh, with that also kind of frequent STI testing. Um, and then um, we, would, we would go ahead for that prescription. Let, let's take an older population for that shared decision-making. So a 52 year old male comes in, uh, he's married, but also has married to a, a, a woman, but also has male partners. And he's thinking he should do something about preventing HIV. How would you approach that? Yeah, I would, I would give him his HIV prevention options, um, which, you know, are, are condom use, um, taking PrEP, doing both, um, you know, thinking about who his partners are, their risk as well, having conversations with his partners about testing, he himself having frequent HIV and STI testing. Um, at this point, if this gentleman is having um, sex without a condom with male partners, um, I would, you know, gently remind him that his risk for HIV is not that of a um, general cisgender man living in the United States, but more so um, the prevalence we see with gay and bisexual men and that um, also um, it would be great from the public health standpoint to not put his um, wife, um, you know, at risk for HIV. And that at this point, you know, PrEP should be considered a great option. I'd want to know more about that risk benefit ratio and that balance by understanding um, his comorbidities, what, what else is going on in his life in terms of medications, past medical history, and kind of having that conversation about um, PrEP, how would PrEP fit in, and um, what are the, the risks between medications and um, other issues? I just want to add, thank you, that's a very comprehensive answer. And I, I want to add that to our, to our clinicians out there. As comprehensive as an approach as, as Rupa just outlined, the time required to do this in a visit is, is not any different than a, 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 a moderate complexity medical visit. It certainly can be done uh, in a 30-minute in a visit for the most part. You don't want to have to rush it because you're building up a rapport with the client. Follow, and that's really for the first visit, 30 to 45 minutes. And then for follow-up visits, it can be done in a much shorter period of time. So the, the, the subtleties of care that we've talked about today are really achievable for all providers in a primary care setting. Rupa, thank you so much for your contributions today. This was a, a really great discussion. I hope our, our, our listening audience got something out of that. And uh, thank you very much. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This activity is developed with our educational partner, Health HIV. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash HNA860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Gilead Sciences Incorporated.